But let me talk, start with the Tehran project, because I think this is a, a pretty interesting example, and in many ways an unanticipated example, because I didn't solicit this project. Um, it just sort of began to evolve. Um, turn this on real quick. Let's see if this, I think we're still live. Yeah. So when you go to, let's see, I'm assuming it's live. <laughs> so I had this site kind of waiting for a second, but let's see if it does. Yeah, okay, good. Looks like it is. All right. Um, so there's a, a project that's been documenting more or less day by day, and in some ways minute by minute, the protests that have taken place since uh, June 13th, uh, is not completely in order, but mostly in order, uh, June 13, 2009, uh, for the elections that happened uh, in Iran. She's documented this in a number of other cities as well, but Tehran is the most robust. There's about a thousand uh, objects that she's uh, taken, and these are primarily uh, material that has been created by people in the streets uh, who had been um, tweeting or uploading YouTube videos or videos to YouTube uh, or Flickr photo, photo streams and other things. And she has a number of collaborators uh, in Tehran. She herself is actually based in Los Angeles. Uh, she speaks uh, Farsi. Um, and what she's been doing is trying to create uh, a day-by-day -day account of what happened uh, in Tehran. And she began by using uh, Google Maps uh, to, use, to do this, Google My Maps. Oops, I think I have a little issue here. Just, uh, the issue here is that I probably didn't reset this thing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just restart it so it doesn't mess this up. Because I, my problem with going live. I think it's from here. It is loaded. She has to take a second to load. But what she's been doing is taking, um, put, not pure, taking um, material that exists on the web and documenting in a day-by-day -day fashion. Um, often hour by hour, sometimes minute by minute, uh, what had been happening in Tehran. Now, this is a project which I would call kind of a curation project, in the sense that she's, and you have to go through over here the objects, so what it has is it tells you the location of where something happened, like 517 unconfirmed bomb blast at Tum, uh, and so forth, uh, shots being fired at 530, a video that's connected to it, um, and you kind of continue down and uh, gunfire heard 832, 834, British embassy accepting wounded and injured. It'll take you to the location of where those things are. Um, there's a number of tweets as well that she's integrated, a number, obviously you can see quite a number of videos. Um, and uh, this is just a single day. So what she's done is she has, um, at this point, I think around a thousand different media objects that she's curated uh, and it's this kind of very rigorous uh, way, that is to say she's located where these videos took place uh, or where the photographs what they're referring to. She's uh, been working with collaborators uh, in Tehran, sort of on the in the streets uh, there, including some of her own family, uh, who have been giving her information. And the maps are not, you know, again, they're not terribly sophisticated in the sense that she's not really problematizing symbology and so forth. We're just talking about using pinpoints and taking a video. But it's a curation project that's deeply interesting because it adds value to information that's in many different places dispersed on the web, but putting it together in a centralized and easily navigable way, you potentially could ask a lot of interesting research questions, not only ones about just the history of the protest, how widespread they were, what particular days you know, things happened, what streets were closed, you know, the, but you could also ask you kind of more soft questions, you know, questions about shame or anxiety or make comparisons with media coverage. Uh, we have a news broadcast, um, actually through another collaboration that we have with a partnership um, at UCLA of kind of official news coverage of the election protests that you can watch side by side with um, the YouTube videos. It's fascinating to see the way in which the news coverage represented the same events, um, but again, from very different perspective, by anchors, by a much more kind of, uh, and depending, of course, what news you're watching, of course, what you're, the perspective can be very different. So this is a project that has been growing the past few years, uh, the past months, rather. It's still ongoing, one, because the protests are still happening, uh, which is surprising to many people. Um, but it's interesting as well to kind of think, okay, here's a way that I can use user-generated content, but because of this curation, I've added a new layer, a very significant layer, about um, documenting something that otherwise hasn't been as sufficiently documented. Um, the project was actually featured in Wired magazine uh, a few months ago, 
and as far as we know, is the biggest collection of user-created content on the Tehran protest that exists online. Um, that is to say, it's just, there's, like I said, over a thousand media objects um, doing this day-by-day -day time uh, discussion. And you can sort of see all the collections that she has. They're all on the side here. And uh, yeah, there's quite a number. Um, yeah, up through, uh, yeah, through February. And this was uh, one of the anniversary projects. So that's, uh, that's, this is a project which I guess I would say is a contemporary project. It's one that doesn't really, again, it's not the deep history of being conducted downward in time, but really a kind of curation of the digital present. And this is something that I think is interesting that Hypercities you know, enables. Um, the other thing that it enables, and I'll, before I even go to, um, we don't have any maps of Tehran, historical maps, um, but we do have this, uh, this collection. The other thing that it enables is, uh, and this is in Oyanti Tambo, is a, a kind of curation of possible futures. And this is something that I've been interested in for a while as well. So you're kind of curating the present, you're talking about the past, these layers you know, of map-based data, um, reconstructions, and so forth. But what about the future? Uh, what about you know, investigating possible futures? Um, what Kozelek will call futures past. That is the way in which a past imagined the future, but didn't actually turn out that way. Uh, those are part of history too, right? The, the, the openness or the possibility of imagining either a utopia or a possible future that may or may not materialize. Um, so we worked uh, with a, a group, um, a local group in Oyate Tambo, and a group of students at the University of Virginia who were down there. Um, Oyate Tambo is an important city because it's the entrance to the Sacred Valley. It's a very big tourist hub. And one of the things that's happening is just the sheer amount of uh, economic boom and bust that's coming to the area, not to mention a, a massive flood that happened there um, the, over the past uh, six months. You've seen a lot of really change uh, in the, um, the physical uh, geography of the city. And so they began investigating, and these maps may look you know, a little bit strange, but you have to look at the metadata to understand them, sort of how they made them. But they began investigating what they called sort of activity note hubs, labor hubs, presses of different kinds of zoning, different kinds of urban orientations, um, all of which to kind of imagine like what urban growth over time sort of might look like if certain models uh, come forward, certain things, uh, certain kind of, I guess certain um, possibilities uh, materialize. And they documented this whole process in a series of public collections that they made, uh, which I think you can see over here. And I don't, um, honestly, I don't know all these collections because I haven't uh, looked through them all. But anything that's a public collection, I guess what you're seeing, there's 14 public collections out of total of 371 public collections that we have. And how this, I should have said this earlier, but how the database works is it's only retrieving stuff that's a function of the time-space juncture that I'm looking at. And so rather than doing a keyword search, which you can do, uh, or say you're typing into Google, you know, I went to Oyanti Tambo, instead you go there, and what it does is it takes this bounding box, as your latitude and longitude, and it takes this time span up here, which happens to be 2008 to 2025, and gives you objects. If you were to expand your, you know, zoom out, you'd obviously have more space, and so you'd have more objects. If you zoom in, you're gonna have fewer. Um, the whole idea was to think, really to rethink in many ways the way in which you access data. And uh, you can do a keyword search, we support that perfectly well, you go into the search bar, and uh, we give you, where is Google search basically, and this, this is just search searches, addresses, and things like that, we didn't make that. But what uh, is interesting, because you can put in uh, any kind of keyword, author, uh, anything that's in our metadata for the objects, but it allows you to do this. You can search in the current view, or you can search to like the world view. Uh, meaning you just want stuff in this very small time frame, you know, it might just be a year. I want 2004, 2005, and I want this very small, this block, right? And I wanna get data. Or you can expand it. I want the whole city over 500 years. And so you're going to get more material. Um, that was an important kind of, I think, innovation for thinking about data organization. Uh, much more, much different than just, oh, here's a bunch of stuff. This is actually a markup based on, you know, those principles of time and place I mentioned earlier. All right. Uh, so I'm getting low on time here. I'll show you like two more collections real quick, and then we can take questions.